What's up guys, welcome to the inside of my computer. This is the command center of my Amazon FBA business. Um, so I'm making this video because I know I haven't shared that much about my own personal results on Amazon in recent history in my YouTube channel. Uh, quite a few of you have been asking me like, what's going on? How am I doing? Are my sales going up? Are they going down? Is my business you know, doing well or is it dying? So I wanted to make this video to answer all of those questions. Um, you may not care about my own sales results, uh, but you may wanna know what a real Amazon FBA business does look like. What do the profit margins look like? Um, you know, sales distribution, costs, all of that sort of stuff. I'm gonna break down as much as I can in this video. So I'm gonna be talking about one single month where I sold just just about, just under $750,000 in a single month. And I'm gonna break that down, what that looks like. I'm gonna talk about the profit, um, all the costs, obviously, the revenue, how I got there. I'm gonna talk about things that went wrong, things that didn't go so well um, on, on the journey of getting to that $750,000. So the month that I wanna show you is December of last year of 2019. So I'm just gonna chuck these uh, figures in here. So it's going from the 1st of December all the way through to the 31st, I'll click apply. So you can see that this is legit. This is actually appearing on my screen. Um, and here we've got $749,729 in total. Did I say that right? $749,729. And at a margin of around about 30% equals $222,000. Before we get into that, by the way, the software that I'm using, the software that I'm gonna show you all of this stuff with is called Shopkeeper, as you can see right here. It's at the moment, it's the best piece of software that I found to be able to accurately track all of your expenses, track your profits by product, by marketplace, um, and, and then it presents it in a really beautiful, nice way. So I've actually only recently started using Shopkeeper, but I would call it an irreplaceable piece of software. It's also super nice to use the UI. It's really rapid and responsive as well. Um, so I'm gonna leave a link down below. If you want to check it out with an extended free trial, Go down below, check out that link, sign up, check it out for yourself and see whether it makes your business easier or not. I can almost guarantee that it will make your life a lot easier if you're selling on Amazon. Um, but that's enough about Shopkeeper. Again, highly recommend it. Uh, let's talk about sales now. So for the month of December to sell $750,000 of product, uh, we actually sold 27,967 units. And that's a unit price if I do the maths quickly. Let me go here, 749 divided by 27. That's around about a $28 selling price, right? So that's obviously we have lots of products. That's the average price. We're selling for around about $27, $28. Um, we sold 7,852 promos. So a promo is either gonna be a discount coupon code that was given out, or it could be the actual, uh, the little green coupon codes as well. Um, so that's 7,800. So we gave away quite a lot. We are finding that the coupons, so again, that little box that you can see on the main listing page, and then they go in and they can click it to redeem it. Um, they work quite well to increase conversion rate a little bit. So we use them quite a lot. And I think most of them are actually those coupons. Refund rate, um, 824 over 28,000 units, let's say that's what, like gonna be 2% or something. 824 divided by 27,967. So we had a refund rate of around about 3%. Now keep in mind, that this was a big peaky month. So the actual refund rate, our average refund rate is closer to 4% thereabouts. Um, so but three, four, 5%, that's a normal refund rate when you're selling on Amazon, anywhere around there. Um, if you're getting something like that, you have nothing to worry about. And then reimbursements, obviously that is where a customer, uh, sorry, that is where Amazon actually loses your inventory or they lose your shipment or something like that. And they're responsible for that. So they actually give us the money back. So we didn't have too many in December. Um, it's not something we worry about too much, but it is important to get that money back, obviously. So those are some of the little numbers that lead into the big number of 750,000. And I'm gonna run through a whole bunch of different things. I'm gonna talk about the marketplaces we're selling in. Uh, we'll give you a breakdown of the profit margin and what that actually looks like in terms of the costs. Um, but as well, I wanted to show you what that looks like in terms of a product selection basis. So of the many products that we're selling, how many or how did those products contribute to the $750,000? Um, so this is a list of all of the products that I'm selling. Obviously, uh, I'm not selling origami. These are just sort of made up pictures to represent each product. Um, but they're here and this is the view that I'm normally looking at. It's just that I see my real products instead of origami. So our best seller was around about the $100,000 mark. So this is in one month, obviously. And then we can you can see basically a range where it starts at $100,000 and that's by far the biggest one. And then most of them go down to 60, 40, 20, 10 um, and going down. And I'll talk about that one in a second. And they go all the way down to 10 and actually much less than that as well. Now this is one peak month for us as well. So for example, this product that sold $122,000 in the month of December, that doesn't normally sell that much. This is uh, by far our best month of the year. And all of these products are quite Christmas seasonal. So just keep in mind that all of these figures are elevated. Um, but the fact is that we're selling products that do well for a particular season. 
And in this time of year, people want to buy our products. And so that's how we can sell, um, you know, $50,000 plus, $100,000 plus. Because if you're familiar with my channel, or if, for example, you're a student as well, you know that I don't like to go for products that are selling $100,000 or $50,000 every month for 12 months of the year. It sounds like a really nice idea. And yes, you're going to sell lots of, or you theoretically going to sell a lot of product by doing so. But realistically, to be able to get margins like this, which are good margins um, of 40, 30% on average, 30%, to get margins like that sustainably, consistently, you realistically are not gonna be able to sell products in that high, high revenue range. So just keep in mind that all these products, when it's outside of Christmas time, so now, for example, in February, most of these products have gone way down. Um, this one is probably selling around about 15 to $20,000 per month. And these, one will, these ones, pardon me, will be around about 10 to 15,000. And then down here, when you're seeing these 10,000, you know, that's already gonna be like $5,000 a month or p potentially even less. What else can you learn from looking at this? Well, keep in mind that I am selling a diversified portfolio of products. So I have multiple brands. I have obviously multiple products within those brands and the revenue, so that's $750,000, that is well diversified across a portfolio of products. And this is what I always recommend that you do as well is you don't bank on just having this one product that maybe sells $100,000 or, you know, maybe it sells $20,000. Um, you bank on building up a portfolio over time. So that's going to be, it could be five products, it could be 10 products, it could be 20 products. It really depends how far you want to grow your business. But understand that you're growing an Amazon FBA business effectively as a portfolio of separate products. And this way, if I have this one product that's doing 50,000 and I made 20,000 in profit in, in December, that's great. But if that product dies um, or it has either problems in the niche or I run into a supply problem and my supplier can't meet the product quality, or something else happens out of the blue, then I know that at least I'll drop out 50,000, but I've got all of these other products to back that one up. And so that's the idea. It's similar to investing. It's similar to most things where you're trying to diversify risk. Keep in mind that you're not just going for this one single product at the top, you're going for a, a stable way to build up all of these products over time so that each one is contributing to your bottom line. And you're gonna have failures. Uh, in amongst those products that you launch, you are gonna have a lot of failures. Um, percentage wise, I would say now we're getting better at doing this, but if you'd asked me last year, I would have said our percentage of failures would be around about 30%. And when I say failure, um, I'm gonna show you one example, but I don't mean that you lose all your money. That's not a failure to me. That, was, that would be the absolute like worst, worst case. Um, generally, you'll get to break even if you have a failing product. Sometimes you'll make some money, but it just isn't enough money. But realistically, for a failed product, you should make your money back. Now that isn't always the case, um, I wanna show you one example right here where you can look at these margins. And on, in this case, in this month, we actually lost a lot of money on this particular product. Now, let me explain what happened here exactly so this doesn't you know, completely scare you off everything. Um, this product was a product that sold very successfully in 2018. And in 2018, which was the year before, the one that we're looking at, we actually made quite a lot of money on this product and a similar variation as well that we were selling. But what happened here? Um, so this one, as far as we can tell from the research that we've done, the, the marketplace just shifted around us. There wasn't anything else that we could really have done. We just had a product that at the time, it was a hot product. Uh, it took off a lot more than we were expecting to. But then what happened was, again, this is why I, I, I advise people not to go into really hot markets. And we weren't trying to, the market just sort of became hot around us while we, started, while we were starting to sell this product. Um, the market really heated up. It became like a really hot product. And then inevitably about four to six months later, that niche became absolutely saturated with competition. And so we had these two products. This was one of them. Um, this one was the worst product. It didn't sell as well as the other one. And we were continuing to sell this product. And we, so we made a lot of money at the start in the first six months, and then it started to taper off. And as the niche became saturated, essentially the prices dropped. Um, and so now a year later, we actually had a lot of excess stock because we were selling at a lower price, making less money. And we were also selling less units than we were before. So this, what you're seeing, this uh, profit margin of minus 65%, Keep in mind that that's the tail end of a product that made money and then made less money. And then at the very end, this is our last shipment, our last units that we're trying to get rid, trying to get rid of, pardon me. And um, we were like, no, nah, let's, let's just get this out of here by the end of December, let's sell it for whatever we can. Um, so in this case, if you do have overstocked products, for example, or stock that you need to get rid of, products like this one where you, do, you no longer wanna sell them, um, a lot of the time, the most efficient way of doing that, of getting rid of them is just lower the price and hit PPC. So we sold out all of these units we could have held on to them for longer if we had really wanted to and made some more of this margin back. 
Um, but in this case, we were happy to just like kill it and move on and start focusing our efforts on products that are making us money. So in conclusion with that one, just understand that that one overall, that product actually made us net profit. It's just that in this last month, we were trying to get rid of it. And it's just like an investment portfolio. Again, let's say you've got 20 stocks, you know, 10 might be doing really well, five might be eh, so-so, and then you might have another five that are actually losing money. And it's all about having that overall portfolio that's doing well. And again, if you've just got one product, keep in mind that that's where you're trying to get to. That product might not be the winning one. It might be a loser. You need to launch more products. You need to improve the process, keep learning, keep getting better. And then you'll end up launching products like these ones. By the way, if you're looking or wondering what does a Amazon FBA business profit margin really look like, 30% is a good margin. Uh, if you, can, you, I mean, you can see on a product level, some of these products are getting 40%. Some people will get products that sell consistently at like a 50% margin. But understand that again, as you're going for this portfolio type of process, your average margin is gonna go down. So as your business gets bigger, it's gonna be increasingly hard to maintain some really good margin like 50%. I would say overall that anywhere from 20 to 30% for Amazon FBA private label is a good profit margin to aim for. Now, here's one other thing um, that I didn't mention. These margins, they include every single cost that comes from Amazon. So anything that you're paying to Amazon or Am anything that Amazon is taking. So that includes all PPC, that includes um, all of the other fees, um, from Amazon, basically fulfillment fees, storage fees, uh, anything, miscellaneous expenses, all of that is included in this, but this is also not including some other expenses. So what are those other expenses that aren't included in this 30% or this 40 to 30% profit margin? Um, for me specifically, the biggest expense is overhead. So I pay my team to do work for me. None of those costs are included in here. Um, and all up, I mean, out of this for the year, all up, it would be a hundred and a hundred and something thousand dollars in uh in overhead the other probably the more relevant thing on a product level that i haven't included in this um in these figures is rebate costs so we are now launching using rebates and ManyChat, and we started doing that towards the end of last year i don't know actually whether in december we were still doing any potentially at the start of the month a few so keep in mind that i mean if in, in the next video where i'll show you the yearly totals which is all of 2019 what that looks like compared to the year before and, and what that will look like this year Keep in mind that when I show you those numbers or when somebody else shows you those numbers, um, they may not be including things like rebate costs. So I think here, this would have to be taken down by, uh, let's say $5,000, something like that. Could be five to $10,000 uh, minus from the total profit figure. Overall though, like again, if you're looking at individual products, 20 to 30% is a great margin. All right, so moving on, I wanna give you a quick breakdown of where this money is coming from, where this profit was made in terms of marketplaces. Uh, if you don't already know, I sell primarily on the US, so most of this profit is being sold on the US marketplace, amazon.com, but I also sell on the UK, amazon.co.uk, as well as in the rest of Europe. And we also have some product being fulfilled from the US into Mexico and into Canada. And if we just break this down here, and again, this is why Shopkeeper really kills it in terms of software, because it shows you all these marketplaces combined in this really nice little total. Um, but as you can see, by far the bulk of what we're selling is coming from the US. We made $200,000 there, 30% margin. But what I wanna give you is just a quick rundown of what the margins look like rather than the, the sort of total revenue. Um, the margins were also good in the UK. So we definitely see that there's more, there's more room to, to, to grow into the US. There's a lot more money to be made in the US. Um, but the UK is, I think it's undervalued. It gets less love than it should. Um, we're going to grow a lot in the UK. And, and I mean, in this one month, we did $45,000 or 35,000 um, pounds, which is not anything to be laughed at. And we did this with a lot less effort as well, with a lot less skill or expertise, I would say, in the UK market than we have in the US marketplace. So we made 13,000 or 10,000 Great British pounds at a 30% margin, which is just as good as the US. Most of the time, in fact, we actually sell at a higher profit margin in the UK than we do in the US. And we definitely see a lot of potential there. So if you're looking at these different marketplaces, if for some reason you don't like the US or if you're maybe based in Europe, I would definitely recommend looking at the UK. These other marketplaces, so the revenue in, in all of these is low. So just disregard that because we don't focus on these marketplaces. I would look at the margins and we basically for our products and the way that we do business, we don't see much potential in, uh, in France or in Spain or in Italy. Um, if you were gonna look at other marketplaces, I think Mexico actually has a lot of potential. This margin should be higher than that. And again, throughout the year, our sales on average have been at a much higher margin than that 20%. They're actually coming out a bit under 30%, but close to it. 
and we don't do any advertising or anything in Mexico and we still make sales. So again, disregarding the revenue, just look at the potential profit to be made and the potential profit margin. Um, I would be looking at Mexico, oh, sorry, I'd be looking at UK, Germany and Mexico as well. Germany is good as well. Um, there's definitely a lot of demand there. We again, just haven't focused on that marketplace. So these will be things that we'll be looking at later in this year. So if you wanna know more about you know which marketplaces to sell on or different tactics, um, again, just stay subscribed to this channel and I'll keep you guys updated as we go through it ourselves. And by the way, people keep asking me this, we don't sell on Amazon Australia and we have no plans to. So if you are looking, if you're an Australian looking to sell on Amazon Australia, just don't. I made a video about it somewhere, which you can find on my channel. Uh, I do not recommend that you start looking at Amazon Australia. It has no advantages versus most of these other marketplaces and it has a lot of disadvantages. So I'll, I'll leave it at there. US, good, UK, good, high potential, Germany and Mexico. Moving on, next you might be wondering, well, how much do you actually have to work to generate this crazy amount of money? And trust me, I understand, e even though I'm looking at this and talking about it you know, in a very blase way, I understand how much freaking money this is. This amount of money, more than $200,000 US, is more than I would make in a few years working as an engineer, which was not too long ago in my recent history. So trust me when I, I, I'm aware of how much money this is and I'm super grateful to be able to take advantage of this Amazon FBA opportunity. But the question is, or the question that I get asked, or the question that you may be wondering is how much do you actually have to work to make this money? Because great, you know, maybe it's a lot of money, but you're just working yourself to the bone to generate it. Well, I track all of my hours every single minute. I'm tracking this right now as I'm filming, as you can see up there. Um, I'm 42 minutes into this. Uh, I had to work an hour a day to generate the $200,000. An hour a day for 30 days. You can see what it looks like where I was working. I guess I worked a lot on that Tuesday, but other than that, not too much. And the reason why, there's, there's more behind that, let me explain. The reason why I didn't have to work very much to make a lot of money is because Amazon FBA, as a business model, it allows you to build systems and processes and it's scalable. So once you have the systems, the processes, once you've got fast your first product, again, you, you're working towards building that product portfolio, all you need to do is just get some people to help you out and have set up processes so those people can do their work for you. And there's a lot more to it than that, I guess. I could go into detail, but now is not the place or the time. So I want you to understand that this is possible. It absolutely is possible for a person like me or for a person like you to do this. All you need to do is, first of all, think in the medium term. Just stop thinking in the short term like this is going to happen overnight. It's going to take for you to build your own business from the start, because remember, I've been doing this for a few years now, it's gonna give yourself a year to make it work. And then from the point of making it working, give yourself another year to two years to be able to set something like this up. And then that's, you're talking a three year time frame. I'm three years into this and this is what's possible. All right, that's enough of my mini rant. Let's move on now. So I wanna give you a breakdown of where that profit is coming from. So what are all of the expenses that I paid in this month of December? Out of that 700 and almost $750,000 what expenses that I have to pay until we get back to the $200,000 in profit. So I'm gonna give you a complete breakdown. Again, Shopkeeper is so great because it's so easy to see this. You can either just click on this breakdown, um, which I'll, I'm gonna show you in a sec, but the way that I like to look at it is in the profit and loss tab. So let's go across to that. I already brought it up. So this is the same period of time we're looking at. And let's just go through each one. And by the way, feel free to pause this video. Feel free to write things down or make calculations if you wanna see what this compares to or how it compares to your own business, to your own products. And I'll try and give you some, just some rules of thumb or some guidelines as we look through this. So I already talked about the unit sold, average unit sale price around about $28. In terms of sale price, um, I see that a lot of people have problems with very low sale prices. If you're trying to sell a product that is, let's say $10 to $15, what you are probably gonna find is that firstly, there's very little profit to be made. You need to move so much volume, so many units to actually make anything significant. That's the first problem. The second problem comes down to advertising. What you'll find is that with your 10 to $15 product, your PPC costs are gonna be very, very expensive. Your ACOS will be, it'll be hard to get any sort of profitable ACOS. You'll probably find that you're getting 50 to 100% ACOS. And the reason why you'll find your PPC will be very high with a low price item will be that your cost per click is actually being bid on or being defined or being set by other products that are at a higher price point in the same niche. So they might be okay to bid, you know, a dollar. So your cost per click is a dollar, but you're trying to compete with a cost per click of a dollar on this $10 product. So it just doesn't work out very well. Um, you can definitely go higher than what we are, which is 25 to $30. Um, we have a lot of successful products that are selling at the 40 to $50 mark. Feel free to go higher than that if you want to sell a product for $100. It really depends on the niche. 
but I would advise you to stay away from those uh, $10, 10 to $15 price points. Next, inventory value. Now here's something that I occasionally get comments about this where people are complaining. They say that I'm misleading people by saying, you know, you can make $750,000 with a $2,000 investment, blah, blah, blah. That is not the case at all. What you need to do is start with one product, which will be now I'm gonna say $5,000 minimum to, to really market it properly. Um, so you start with one product at $5,000 and then you build that. If you continually, if that product does well, you continually reinvest all of your profits. You don't take out a salary. You don't start just living off that money. Keep reinvesting it. What you'll be doing is reinvesting that into new products, which is gonna increase your in inventory value, pardon me. And each, uh, each product that you have, each dollar of inventory you have, essentially is gonna pay you a return on investment. So this is exactly like, I'm gonna keep mentioning stocks because this is what it's like, just on a much more profitable kind of scale is that if you have $1,000 in product, you should get, uh, uh, let's say 100 to 300% annual ROI on that inventory. So that is gonna be, if you've got $1,000 invested, you should get 1,000 to let's say $3,000 out in profit per year. So in this case, to make the $200,000 in profit, I actually had $131,000 of inventory sold in Amazon, right? So keep in mind that yes, that is a lot of money, but I've been building it up over time, reinvesting the profits from the business back into more and more inventory that's paying me money, right? So if you look at it from an investment perspective, I basically had $131,000 in inventory in Amazon and that $131,000 paid me $220,000 in one month, right? And you can, you can duplicate that a few times per year. So that's how you get 100 to 300% ROI annually for each dollar you put into inventory. Once you start looking at it like this, it's really quite logical. It makes sense. This is just a series of investments that you're making in products that make you cash flow. They make you money. All right, so that's inventory value. Let's go through the rest of it now. So principal, that is how much, uh, how much money my product sold for in total in December was $750,000. Now, the rest of these are actually not that relevant. They mostly just cancel each other out. So tax is sales tax. Uh, what are the other big ones? Gift wrap tax, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And th these are green, by the way, which means they're actually uh, income rather than expenses. So like I said, they cancel each other out, so I won't worry about them too much. So promos, those are discounts. So this $750,000 is actually the sort of normal sale price of all of those products. But like I said, we use coupons on some of them. We probably had some discount codes as well. Um, so that was $10,000 taken away from that in total. So that leaves us with $749,000. Again, like I said, most of them cancel each other out. Now here are the fees that you wanna look at. So you can, if you wanna pause this and look at some ratios, for example, you can do that. But on uh, $750,000 of revenue, we had in referral fees, which is the 15% of the sales price, 100,000. Um, FBA fees, 150,000. Monthly storage fees. So these are highly elevated because in October, November, and December, you're actually gonna pay around about, I think it's around about four times the normal monthly storage fees. And the reason why is because there's so much extra demand that you can sell $750,000 in one month that for us, we are just gonna pay that all day long because we're making so much more money in return. What else? Coupon redemption fees. So again, that is the promos, that's the discounts. And the only other thing, review enrollment fees. So that comes from the early reviewer program. Um, I don't even remember what the fee is right now. It's like 50 bucks per ASIN and you can get a couple of reviews out of it. Highly recommended if you're just starting out, you don't have other ways of getting reviews. So those are the primary Amazon FBA related fulfillment and storage and referral fees. That's everything that we pay. Now I've definitely noticed, um, I get quite a lot of comments from people that have the kind of wrong attitude or the wrong mindset when it comes to paying these fees. Just keep in mind that these fees are there, they're, they're, they're pretty much paid across the board by everyone who's selling on Amazon. It's a level playing field and yes, they may seem expensive, but I hope you can see from this particular example that the opportunity that Amazon is giving you as, as a platform is immense. And to pay these fees in order to access that sort of marketplace and this amount of demand out there by consumers who are willing to buy any, like almost any product is just insane. And it's, and it's a trade-off that I will make every single day, whether I'm awake, whether I'm asleep, wherever I am, I'm absolutely gonna pay these fees and be happy to because I know what the potential is, what that allows me to access. So I would just say that if you are viewing these fees as like you, you're seeing them like taking away of your profit or stealing from you, or you think Amazon is just out to get you, I think unfortunately that mindset is not gonna help you succeed. Um, and I hope that I can with through this channel teach you the, the better way to look at this, which is understand that it's just a platform, it's just a tool to be used, and it's up to us to use it wisely. If we don't use it wisely, then yeah, of course, the fees are gonna eat all your profit because you're not doing something right. Remember, it's just a level playing field. Sorry, that's a bit of a rant. Um, those are the Amazon fees we pay. 
manufacturing. So by the way, uh, that was the average inventory value. So the actual, uh, the cost of goods sold in the month was 200,000 in total. So there's a bit of a difference there. So moving on to miscellaneous fees, now sales tax, payable, receivable, that should cancel out with these two. So again, the net is roughly zero. PPC, $40,000. So here's the same sort of thing. I, I get this a lot where people are complaining about PPC eating up all of their spend or they're trying to troubleshoot PPC because it's eating all of their profit. Normally, if your FBA fees and your PPC is eating all of your profit, the fault or the, the real root cause of the problem is not the fees and it's not the PPC. You probably have a product issue or you've done something else wrong further down the line, particularly around product research, particularly around choosing a niche, um, particularly around differentiating your product to make it better than the competition. If you haven't done those things correctly, or at least according to the way that I teach it, most likely you're gonna find that your PPC costs and your Amazon FBA fees, plus your manufacturing costs, plus your cost of goods sold, those fees will eat up all of your profit. But it's not around trying to reduce those fees and that's where you need to be make a profitable business. What you're doing wrong is something further back in the product research phase. Because again, I will pay this $40,000 every single day of the week because I know that, and I can't show this data here through Shopkeeper, but this was very profitable PPC. We were making money on almost every single sale that we made through PPC. So if that's $40,000 that I'm happy to spend. Uh, what else we got? Some miscellaneous stuff and then some more miscellaneous stuff, which is warehouse reimbursements, things like that. Um, use Helium 10, by the way, if you have Helium 10, has a section where you can automatically get the reimbursements calculated and then submitted to Amazon. Um, that stuff does add up. Here, we, uh, we normally get around this much back and if you're not doing this, you're just missing out on free money basically. So definitely get those reimbursements done. Again, through Helium 10. Um, and if you don't have Helium 10, check out the links down below. You can get a discount on your first month or a lifetime discount using my link. And that's about it. So that is every single thing that we paid to get to the grand total of $222,000 in profit in US dollars. Now, again, what are the things that are, that are coming out of that that aren't included? It's overhead. So that's if you have a team you need to pay for. And it's also anything that may be off Amazon's books. So it could be rebates that you're paying manually through PayPal and any other miscellaneous expenses like software, for example. So I would say that we made in this month uh, net around about 200 and low $200,000 in profit. And from where I'm sitting, I really can't complain and I really want you guys to be able to take advantage of this as well. So that's the fee breakdown. The last thing I wanted to show you was a day-by-day -day breakdown of what this single month of $750,000, what that looked like on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, again, remember this is Q4, this is peak period. So depending on what products you're selling, your peak period of the year, maybe it may not be December, it may be summer, for example, depending on the product, if it's an outdoorsy product or something that's just summer seasonal, or you might have, you know, let's say a Valentine's Day sort of, or a, some other giftable type product that only is giftable on a particular day, then you could look at similar patterns, but in a different time of the year. But for us, it's December. So I wanna show you um, a couple of things. So first of all, day by day, what does it look like? You can see the profit margins. And just first of all, like, I wanna show you how crazy this opportunity is, that our lowest day of the month was 7,000. So that's basically like, that's after Q4, that's just normal. Um, we had, uh, what's that, Cyber Monday, I guess, $35,000, $10,000 profit in one day. And you can see it just goes up and up and up, hitting $35,000 days or $30,000 days with regularity. And then we peaked, actually we peaked in profit a couple of days after revenue, which is weird. I guess that's just our, the, pro the products that we were selling were more profitable at the end. Um, but guys, like $40,000, $46,000 almost in one day, $15,000 profit or $14,000, sorry. But, but then the next day, almost $16,000 in profit in a single day, in 24 hours. I, I hope you're seeing the, the craziness, the scale of Amazon. And this is obviously across marketplaces. Most of this is from the US, but you can do the same thing once you scale your business in the UK, you could do it in, in, in Germany or wherever else it may be. The scale here, the, the size of the opportunity is just crazy. So that's profit um, and revenue. And obviously, by the way, the peak is before Christmas because everyone's buying stuff for Christmas, but there's a delay, which is the shipping delay. And Amazon actually says, what is the last day that you can get this shipped to receive it by Christmas? And for most people, it is around about, around about the 16th, 17th, maybe 18th, um, sometimes depending on the year of December. So in this case, once people aren't able to get their products in time for Christmas day or Christmas Eve even, then they start to taper off and the purchases go down and then it's just back to normal after that. So now we're looking at PPC versus units sold. And I just wanted to illustrate this point again, that PPC is not bad. PPC is just a way of marketing your products. 
So if you're making money on the PPC, uh, on the sales that you get through PPC, you wanna spend more and more and more. And that's what we did. We basically tracked increasing spend. We just kept increasing our budgets because we knew that all of this was selling. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I would say at a below 20% PPC ACOS. Um, so we're making good money. If our margins after PPC are 30%, we're obviously making a decent amount of profit on every sale that we get through Amazon's advertising. So we cranked it up and spent more and more and more until we peaked at a PPC spend of $2,000 in that single day on 14th of December. Then the PPC spend goes down, obviously correlating with the unit sold going down. That's a look at the entire business as a whole, what that looks like. But I wanted to show you at least one example of what this looks like um, as we're juggling this portfolio of products. So what does one specific product look like in this time frame? And I'm just gonna show you the our, our best-selling product, which sold again, $120,000 in revenue during the single month. So what happened here is we did the same thing. We were basically cranking as much PPC spend as we possibly could because it was very profitable, trying to sell as many units as possible. But what happens with peak periods like this, uh, for us again being December, but in general, it's quite hard to actually predict or, or to optimize your sales velocity, which dictates how much profit you're making, and then also managing your inventory forecasting at the same time to make sure that you can stay in stock. So what happened here was we started selling too many units of this specific product. So we were gonna sell out and be sold out for a very long time as well. So around the time that we peaked, um, basically we knew that units were gonna go up until the peak or the sales velocity was gonna go up and then it was gonna go down again. So at this point, we knew that sales velocity was dropping anyway. And we knew that we were gonna sell out if we kept selling, if we kept spending much more, more money on PPC. So we cut the PPC off and you can see the sales went down obviously with the end of Christmas and they dropped to a more manageable level. Now this is a little bit controversial, this approach, and I can talk about this in a future video. Um, some people would say to just maintain their PPC spend and actually try and keep the sales velocity as high as possible until you run out of stock. Um, for me personally, I honestly don't believe that that maximizes profit. Um, so we kept the, the price and everything in a pretty stable range. We just wanted to sell out uh, for as long as possible to stay in stock and to make as much money as possible because we know we can re-rank this product. It's a great product. Um, so we stopped the PPC and we got to therefore keep, let's say $100 a day in extra profit from this product alone just by not spending that PPC. So for us, that was a good choice. And the last thing I wanna show you is the inventory in stock versus revenue. So this just looks like a number to you. It's a big number. It's a lot of profit at the end of the day, but what other stuff is happening behind the scenes? What are the other things that you're juggling and balancing like this PPC spend, for example, um, to make this all happen and to end up with $200,000 in your pocket at the end of the day. So I wanna show you inventory versus revenue. And basically what happened here or in able to make this happen, we were planning probably three to four to maybe even five months ahead, planning for this inventory that we would need to send in. And so we were getting all the orders done, sending that in so that it arrived in Amazon in October or November. And so once December hits and the sales start to go up, crazily up, um, we don't ship anything in. We're not trying to ship things in last minute. We've already done all of the work. All we need to do is just rake in the money basically. So you can see we started the month at $47,000 or almost 48,000, sorry, units, not dollars in inventory sitting in stock in Amazon. And as the sales increase, the inventory goes down. Nothing new is coming in. There's no time to do that. It just keeps going down. And then the sales peak and the sales start dropping to a more sustainable level of around about $9,000 a day. Um, and you can see our inventory level goes down to around about 20,000 units. And that's a much more sustainable level. Um, but basically everything that we were selling in December, it had to be shipped in in November, which means we had to make it or get it manufactured in like August, right? So this is a long-term plan coming to fruition in this single month. This is pretty much how I sold $750,000 in one month. So just to recap, you know where that money is coming from. You know the product portfolio selection and the strategy that I've been using you know what margins should look like, you know where all of those fees are coming from down to the dollar, because I've shown you them. Um, you know which marketplaces have high potential, which ones you should be looking at if you're gonna be selling in them. Uh, you pretty much know everything that I could possibly show you about this business, how it works, um, and how you can generate extraordinary results like this. So I hope you found this video valuable. Make sure or remember that I will be releasing another video like this, but covering 2019 as a whole year. And then I'll also be doing a comparison of 2020. So if you're looking at selling this year on Amazon and you wanna know what's changing, what has changed already, what information is out of date, what strategies are working, or in other words, if you wanna be on the cutting edge of Amazon FBA in 2020 so that you know what's really working, make sure to subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell as well so you get the videos as they come out. Make sure to smash the like button if you enjoyed this video and if you got value out of it, 
leave me a comment if you have questions about anything you want something like this answered or you want me to make another video about something if you want shopkeeper if you want to use this information for your own business as well then definitely check out the link down below um, the special link that i've put in there will give you an extended free trial so you can try it with no risk uh, lastly, if you want to get mentored by me, then definitely check out my course link in the description as well. That's for the FBA Freedom Accelerator and you can get personal mentorship from me in the FBA Freedom Accelerator. That's about it guys. I hope you found this video really valuable and I'll see you in the next one.